Hi everyone, thank you for joining Cake Talk. Oh, my ponytail is so lopsided today. Maybe that's a bit better, maybe. Um, <laughs> so I wanna get started. I'm wearing one of my favorite t-shirts. Let me move back for you. Yes. It's actually one of the first t-shirts I wore and had to kick it in the introduction video, except the first one was black and it was it was different and had long sleeves. And now we've made it in purple. I happen to love purple. And there's going to be a special sale on howtokickit.com dedicated to uh, a woman I really like because it's her birthday. And this t-shirt is the clue. Okay, I'm going to start asking, or I'm not going to ask you questions. I'm going to answer your questions. Oh, I have to bring up the questions on the side. I was thinking, where is everyone? That was my fault. Okay, here we go. This is from Avery H underscore rocks. Hi, Avery. Um, what is the difference between luster and highlighter? Well, highlighter generally only comes in two uh, metallics, which are gold and silver. At least that's all I've ever seen. <coughs> Excuse me. And they're just sort of more uh, lustrous, more metallic and more shiny. However, highlighters aren't technically edible. They are non-toxic, but they're recommended to use on parts of the cake that people won't necessarily eat, just like uh, disco dust. Same thing. Disco dust is not edible at all. Um, and that's the red stuff that I used on um, the Wicked Witch's slippers this week but it does come in a lot of different colors. So luster is available in more colors than just metallic. Like there's greens and yellows and pinks and purples and basically the whole rainbow of colors. And uh, they're just, they're a little softer too. I don't, I don't really know how to describe it, but on the end of your brush, they seem to apply a little bit softer and go on smoother than highlighter does. That's just my opinion. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's the basic difference. I know that there are different brands that I've even never tried myself because they're not readily available to me, but I love trying new lusters and new colors whenever I see them. Okay, next. This is from Ashlyn dot wines 21 on Instagram. Do you ever reuse your cake boards? Yes. If I use um, a cake board at the base of a cake and I haven't like scratched it or, you know, it hasn't gotten wet or dirty. Uh, yeah. I absolutely like wash the surface back down and use them again. Obviously the boards that I insert inside cakes with dowels uh, for structure, those I don't reuse because they sort of get all warped and dirty from the cake. So no, and they're usually cut to a specific size. Okay, next. Um, this is from Jojo Smiles on Instagram. I'm not that good at frosting. How do you know the amount of frosting to add when crumb coating? Well, when you're crumb coating, you just want to add a little bit of frosting at a time on the end of your spatula, and you really want to press it into the sides and the top of your cake because you're just kind of putting down the layer of frosting to glue all the crumbs to the cake. And you don't want to waste it because if you put a ton on and you crumb coat and then you have all this extra crummy frosting, you don't want to ice your cake with that. So you just take a little at a time as you crumb coat until the whole cake is crumb coated and whatever, it, sometimes you have a little bit left over, just eat it with some cake scraps so that you can use nice new frosting when you ice your cake after your crumb coat. Okay, I always do this. I always read the question, put my phone down. I shouldn't do that. I should keep it in my hand. Okay, here we go. This is from Jesse underscore 148 on Instagram. Why do butter and sugar have to be room temperature? Well, if your butter is cold from the fridge and your sugar is naturally room temperature, then when you go to cream them, you're just sort of making your job a lot harder, especially if you're using a, a spoon or a hand mixer as opposed to a mixer. But even when you put that into a stand mixer, you can really hear like the gears grinding because it has to beat the butter that much harder. So if your butter is room temperature and your sugar is room temperature, then you're gonna get the nicest, fluffiest, butter and sugar combination. And at the end of the day, that's what you want. The more air you can incorporate there, the better that your batter will be. The better your batter will be. Okay, this is from Melissa on Instagram. What is the, what 
are the decorating tools that you use most besides the basics? I'm starting a home bakery and want to buy smart. Okay, um, well, I'm not sure what you would consider basics, but if you're doing cake decorating, good rolling pin is very helpful. A good French rolling pin to pull, uh, to lift up your fondant if you're using fondant is also very helpful. Uh, a fondant smoother or two, sometimes two comes in handy depending on the type of cake that you're making. A sharp paring knife and a sharp serrated knife. I can't say it enough. Of course, I'm going to say a ruler. And then a variety of spatulas. Like I have spatulas that are small, large, offset, not offset. Um, it's really, really helpful just to have a variety. I didn't go out and you know buy all of this in one shot. I built up, so I just bought my cake pans as I went. And over a lot of years, I have collected a lot of them. So that's where I would start. I don't. I'm not sure if I've missed anything. Piping bags and some tips if you're gonna. Um, do that sort of cake decorating. And I also loved uh, sets of cutters, like round cutters, square cutters, star cutters. Those can be very helpful too. So good luck with your home bakery. Uh, yeah. And don't worry, you'll collect all the things you need uh, over the years. Okay. Oh, this is a really popular question at the moment. This is from Sienna underscore link underscore 17 on Instagram. Can you do the 100 layers challenge but with fondant? This is probably one of the top questions now. Half of you want me to do with fondant and half of you want me to do with cake. Uh, the reason I haven't done it is truthfully, it's just super wasteful because if I were to roll out 100 layers of fondant and pile them on top of each other, I'd obviously want to do it in different colors so at least you could see and count the 100 layers. But then once all those colors touch each other, they're going to stain each other and I'll have to get rid of the fondant. And also because once I roll it out and leave it out and put another layer and another layer and another layer, then all those layers are going to get an elephant skin and dry out. And so I won't be able to reuse that fondant. So I find this request interesting because there's so many people who watch How to Cake It who are so concerned over what happens to the cake and they're very concerned as to whether it gets you know, thrown in the garbage. But if I do this 100 layers of fondant, it will get thrown in the garbage. So that kind of makes me feel really bad and fondant is not that cheap. Um, but yeah, this is a huge, huge craze right now. Okay, this is from Asmer, ASMR underscore Delano on Instagram. What is the most abstract simple syrup flavor you could think you think you could make? Huh. Abstract. Huh. Um, I sometimes think something cool like a rose water simple syrup or putting the petals of edible flowers into the simple syrup might be cool. I've never done that before. Well, the closest thing I've done is the lavender simple syrup that I did in um Easter, Easter mega cake. Yeah, that's probably the most different simple syrup I've ever made. Uh, but I'm open to suggestions as long as they go with the cakes I'm making. But I do think something floral would be kind of cool. Uh, okay, I'm going to answer some questions on the screen because I don't want to ignore anyone. Okay. Oh, wow, that's funny. I... Okay, this is from Jeanette Becker, and I was just talking about this. Hi, hey, yo, how can I avoid elephant skin on fondant? Could it be the qual quality I'm using? I'm going crazy. I can't get rid of it. Yes, I do find different brands skin differently, um, and that's really difficult. Some brands get a skin almost instantly. So by the time you're rolling it out and, and trimming it and pick it, picking it up to put it on your cake, it already has a skin. That drives me crazy. I've been there, Jeanette. I've been there. Um, yeah, try different brands. If you're using a brand that you find uh, on the dry side, you can also knead uh, a bit of vegetable shortening into the fondant before rolling it out. But basically, the drier the fondant is, A, the harder it is to roll out, and B, the faster you have to be with it. But sometimes that just doesn't work. Sometimes it's just dried out, unfortunately. But elephant skins drive me crazy. Crazy. Okay, next question. Okay, here we go. 
This is from Tom Pisani. Hello, Tom. Is it normal for your vanilla cake to curdle? Because when I made it, it curdled, and is that a problem? It will still bake if it curdles, but uh, mine doesn't normally curdle, and that is, again, I can't stress enough, um, room temperature. So you want your butter to be room temperature. You want your milk to be all the way room temperature. Not a little bit cool, room temperature. In fact, I'd prefer it if you even used it lukewarm. Like if you had to put it in the microwave, you know, for a minute on defrost or whatever, just to get all of the chill out of it, that will really help with the curdling. Because what's happening is if anything is cold, even if it was room temperature, let's say, but your room is on the cold side, um, once you're mixing it, when the fat and all the, especially all the liquid, like the milk get together, that those little butter bits just don't smooth out. They make, they curdle, basically. They basically curdle in the liquid. So room temperature is really important. Really, really beat your butter and sugar. And then also when you're adding the flour and the milk, remember to alternate. Alternate and mix, um, mix until that flour is incorporated, scrape it down, uh, add the milk, do the same thing, and repeat. So hopefully next time it won't curdle. Okay. Next. Okay. Here's a here's a good idea from Christian Cruz. If you end up doing a Ghostbuster cake, it would be cool to see simple syrup green. Green simple syrup. That would be very cool. I haven't done colored simple syrup. I've only done colored cake and colored buttercream. Huh. Okay, here's another question. Oh, I get, oh, Silly Willy. I'm going to answer your question, Silly Willy. Do you make your fondant or buy it? I buy it. I always have. I use a ton of fondant. I would be making fondant for days. Also, making fondant can be hard on the motor of your stand mixer, and I use way too much. So I buy my fondant, and I enjoy that. <laughs> okay, next. Um, oh wow, this is a good question. This is from Fatima Mula. Hi yo, has a cake ever frustrated you to the point of crying before? Absolutely. Not on the show, let me think about it. No, not on the show, not to the point of crying. Actually, when I made the ASAP science book for my back to school cake last year, um, I had some trouble. It was an extremely humid day. And I didn't know about my fridge. Yes, you. My fridge was breaking. And I didn't realize it until I was in the process of making um, the cake. So I kept putting my cake in the fridge. And it wasn't really cooling. So it was extremely sweaty. And if you remember that book, I had to write all over it. I wanted to cry. We actually had to. We were filming. And we had to sort of stop the day. Um, and we had to pick up the next day. Because I had to get somebody to come look at my fridge. And I basically couldn't finish. And I really, really wanted to cry. Uh, but it all worked out. It all worked out. So yes, of course, I'm human. Cakes can be frustrating. Sometimes things don't go the way you thought they would in your mind. Um, but that happened to me a lot more earlier on in my cake decorating career. Now I think I'm good at thinking it through and sort of knowing the problems, learning from the problems that I have had in the past. Oh, here we go. This is an excellent question. Hi, Yolanda. Would, I would love to know where you get your sphere bowls. I can't seem to find them anywhere online where they ship abroad. I live in the Philippines, by the way. Hello, this is from Katrina Castaneda. Okay, so um, the sphere, I have a few sphere pens. The six inch one I have, which I used, I think, um, in the ornaments. And I also think I used it as a kettlebell. I definitely use it as one of the ornaments, the biggest ornament. That is a Wilton pen. It's a six inch sphere. I think they only make that size. Then I have two smaller sphere pens. One is five inches and one is four inches. I actually bought those in the year 2000 in England at a cake decorating supply store. I've actually never seen them here where I'm from. I don't remember the brand. I should look that up. I do not remember the brand, but I bought them in a cake decorating store. I remember that they were so expensive, especially because I'm Canadian and it was in British pounds. Um, but I absolutely love them and still use them to this day. I take great care of them. Uh, and then the biggest sphere pans I have, which I used for like BB-8, 
and Pokeball were, are actually two eight inch diameter bowls from Ikea because they're very, very rounded and I love them. And when I saw them, when Ikea put them out, I thought, oh my gosh, I could bake in that. Actually, I think Ikea makes a smaller version of those. I want to say it's probably four or five inches. As long as it's pure stainless steel, then you can grease it and line it and bake in it. Okay, this is from Silly Willy. Oh, Silly Willy. I love your name. Um, oh, and I love that your little, your icon is like a bitmoji of you in a front, in, of you in front of pizza. I love that bitmoji. Okay, what is your next cake idea? Huh. Well, today I am making, I'll give you a clue. Today, after I'm done, I'm going to be filming with Sasha and I'm making a form of hat some type of a hat and tomorrow when we film i'm going to be making one of the most requested cakes that i get it's something it's an object from my kitchen he may or may not have a name that's all you're getting okay Okay, here we go. Hi, yo. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, you have collaborated with Casper and Antonella, so is there any way, chance we can see the Complete Sugar Stars team again on your channel? Rashimi. Okay, I'm going to address this. Um, no, there isn't a chance, unfortunately, but I would love to have Casper or Antonella back. We are still great friends. Uh, Casper's been on my show twice, actually. I need to have Auntie back, because she's only been on once. So i got to think of what I can make with her. I thought grilled cheese was like, perfect because she loves cooking and her husband cooks uh, but no unfortunately you will not see the whole sugar stars team in this kitchen but I will tell Casper and Antonella that you say hi thank you and then next there's so many questions today wow okay this is from Hafsa I don't want to say your last name because I'm going to ruin it Hafsa Saif Saifudin I'm so sorry. Hi, Yolanda. I wanted to ask, when will you do a collaboration with Rosanna Panzino? Please answer. Okay, I'm answering. Um, I don't know. I would love, of course, to collaborate with the biggest baker on YouTube. That would be amazing. She does live in California, and I live in Canada, so that would require some traveling. But yeah, that would be amazing. And it is also one of the most requested questions I certainly get on my Instagram and all over the place. So hopefully... One day that will actually happen. Next question. Okay. Okay. Let's, let me answer this question. This is from Hamza Chima. Hey, Yolanda, my question is, whenever I make Italian meringue buttercream, I get up to the point where you have to pour in the hot caramel, but that... But at that point, it splits and then goes to wait. What waste? What am I doing wrong? Well, first of all, I hope you're not boiling your sugar until it is caramel. Because if your sugar has turned brown at all, it is way too hot. It is past the point that you need to take it to. You need to take it to four, 240 degrees, and that is what is called softball stage. So if you are making caramel and point, pouring it in, you're sort of starting off the wrong way to begin with. Um, you do need to make sure that the temperature is absolutely correct. If you go past that temperature and it's hotter and you pour it in, what ends up happening is it's, it's actually in the hardball stage. And so it basically pours into the egg whites and then splits up and makes little shards of sugar, like basically the same way they would make hard candy. And you don't want that. You need to keep it at softball and you need to make sure that your egg whites are whipped to a nice soft meringue or a nice soft peaks rather, so that you can make your meringue. And then when you pour in the caramel, you don't wanna dump it all in. You wanna pour it to the side of the stand mixer in like a steady stream so that it's getting um, whipped in evenly and cooking the egg whites at the same time. So hopefully that has helped you. I hope you'll try again and uh, let me know how it goes. Next question. Oh, I answered that one. Silly Willie says, thank you. You're welcome, Silly Willie. Okay. Oh, wow. Here we go. Again, from Fatima Mula. I've heard people say expiration dates on food coloring shouldn't be taken too seriously. What do you say? 
Well, I think you should always pay attention to an expiration date, number one. Number two, I've never had a food coloring past its expiration date because I use it so frequently. Um, but I will tell you that they do go bad. Sometimes when I have like a half container um, and perhaps there's just a little more air in the container, I find that the gel food colorings kind of become a little bit granular. You can, uh, first of all, they do dry up too. So sometimes they use, they lose some of their moisture and the gel becomes kind of like sticky and gloopy, is gloopy a word? And you can reconstitute them with a little bit of clear glycerin. So you can pour clear glycerin in, stir it up, and it should come back to the right consistency. But I that. So sometimes, um, the first time I ever discovered that, I thought, oh, I'm sure this will still work. And I kneaded my food coloring into the fondant, and then I had all these tiny little bits everywhere. Um, so once it gets to that point, I usually just unfortunately have to toss it away and get a new one. Next question. Um, okay, let's see. Oh, see, I'm doing this wrong. Every single time I answer a question, I'm supposed to delete it so that it doesn't confuse me. And I wasn't doing that. Okay, next, this is from Sarah and Toasty on Instagram. How did you develop the recipe for your ultimate vanilla and chocolate cake? They are dense and heavenly. To tell you the truth, I don't even remember where I got the original recipe. When I was younger, I used to be crazy about cutting recipes out of magazines. Yes, it was before the internet. Uh, I used to be crazy about cutting recipes out of magazines. I also had, or my dad had some old like uh, baking books. So I would always try them all. And when I found those two, I liked them as they were. But when I started to make novelty cakes, I just needed them to be stronger. So basically, I just kept playing with them, adding a bit more flour, trying to change the sugar content. The other thing is often when you find a recipe, it makes, you know, let's say an eight inch cake or a 10 inch cake. But when I need to make a shark, I need to be able to um, multiply these recipes uh, dramatically. And sometimes that actually changes how they bake. So that's another thing I had to test. So not only did I have to play with the recipe to make it nice and dense, yet moist and still flavorful, but to be able to make different quantities without it affecting the batter. So basically it was just time, a lot of time. A lot of time and a lot of baking and just noticing how the recipe reacts. And even when I got this oven, I used to bake at home in my mom's kitchen and I found there was such a difference when I started to bake in a professional oven. So even at that point, I had to make some adjust adjustments just because the oven worked so differently. Okay, next. Oh, what did I just do? Okay. Is there any more questions on the screen that I haven't answered? Oh, silly Willie, silly Willie. You're not silly at all. You have good questions. What's the longest time it's taken you to make a cake? What's the latest you've ever shot? Well, when we first started how to cake it, uh, we thought we could attempt to shoot more than one video in a day. So there was a day where we shot two cakes. For some reason, I can't remember what the first one was. But the second one was definitely my candy cake, like the, um, the one that was checkerboard inside and pink and yellow and green with the shards of chocolate, the mega candy cake. And we shot two cakes in a row. But by the time I started the mega candy cake, it was probably like 10 o'clock at night. So we left here. It was Chet at the time, me, Chet, and Jocelyn left at 4 a.m. Yeah, that was so tiring. I remember at the beginning of this process in a lot of my earlier videos, I do have comments from people who are like, you look so tired. You look so tired because I was so tired. The other thing we would do is we would film a cake and then I would do the interview right after. So what I mean by interview is when I do my novelty cakes, I actually just focus on working because it takes a lot of focus. And then once I'm done, you see me sitting in the chair and I explain to you what I did. And we would often do that right after. And so I always appeared so tired because I was so tired. So we no longer do that. We usually do the cake and then do the interview like the next day or within the next two days so that I could be fresh and actually speak. Okay. 
Uh, let me answer another question on here. Okay, this is interesting. At Abigail Pond on Instagram, what do you think your career would be without internet or social media? This is such an interesting question. And whenever I get this question, I know that the person asking it is younger than me because um, I actually grew up in a world without social media. Uh, and by the time I had social media, I was in my late 20s. So I, I'm kind of conflicted because I'm like on this fence. On one hand, I reminisce about what it was like without it. And on the other hand, I thoroughly enjoy it. Um, but my career would be what it always was, which was standing in this kitchen making cakes. I did that for 16 years before anybody was watching me do it. And my career would still be that because that's what I love. I do love doing it on social media via YouTube and Instagram and all the wonderful things and Facebook because now it feels a lot more, it just kind of feels like a new step on the ladder. It feels very fulfilling to make the cakes that I want to make and show them to all of you and hear your reactions and feedback. Um, yeah, so I, I think if I were to go back now and just be in this kitchen alone and not share my case with the world, I'd probably be very sad because I've gotten used to it and I, and I really, really enjoy it. So the next question is, oh, if you, if, oh, I think Sasha's here. Oh, is it time for me to go? I'm just going to close the door quickly. One second. Okay. Okay. So now, just because I want to answer something I've never answered before, before I have to go. Oh, here's another question that rolls into the last one, the pink palette on Instagram. If you didn't have a YouTube channel on cake, what would you do on it? I wouldn't have a YouTube channel. I would be standing in here making cakes with nobody watching. That's what I would be doing. The only reason I'm on YouTube is because um, I make cakes for a living, and then I was on a Canadian TV show, and Jocelyn and Connie created that TV show, and after it was done, they wanted to continue working with me and we chose YouTube. We were sort of, they were very interested in YouTube. Uh, it was a change for them. It was a huge change for me. And we all love that change. But if I didn't make cakes, I wouldn't do anything on YouTube because I don't know how to do anything else. Or maybe I could have a channel with me just like using a ruler. I, I think two million people would watch that, right? No? Okay, I've got to pick maybe two more questions okay oh this is a good question from Ariel Don Barrow on Instagram hey yo I really hope you see this I do my question is would you ever consider holding cake classes um I would but not at the moment I would love to do that uh, I would love to do that around the world because obviously I love traveling and I don't expect everyone to come to Toronto so maybe I do both but at the moment no YouTube is our full-time job it's it's constant it's crazy but in a good way so at the moment I just don't have time because I really need to we need to make an episode every single week for you guys and finally the last question okay here's a question from Stephanie Arena how does your cake stay full after taking them out of the pan? Like, how do they not fall apart? Well, they don't fall apart because my recipes, uh, as mentioned earlier, are very dense. And also, I'm a big believer in pulling my cakes completely in the pan. And as well, when I carve them, I actually like to chill them in the fridge because it makes such a difference. There's a lot less crumbling. You have more control. Some cake decorators actually like to freeze their cakes before carving. I find chilling enough but if you're doing it warm at all or just sort of freshly baked and just cooled at room temperature you'll get a lot more crumbling which can be really different uh, really difficult uh, especially when making shaped cakes so that is it I think I don't think I have time Wow oh here's a good question this is from Alicia Hall on Facebook hi yo 
What do you use to cover your cake boards, especially when you make templates out of them? I actually don't cover my cake boards with anything. Cake boards in this country are sold covered in like usually either a silver, gold, or a white paper, and it's kind of like a wipeable paper, so they come covered. I am under the impression that in other countries they don't. I think they come just as cardboard, and then you buy the paper separately and cover your own. I have also um, used, in the cases where I have to make my own cake board, like sometimes I need a cake board that is wood, um, I'll cover those with shelf liner. So they sell this stuff that you can, it's like a giant sticker, and it's like food safe because people it in their cupboards with their plates and stuff like that so I have used that on occasion when I have to use a wooden uh, cake board just because of the size or the weight of my cake so I hope that is helpful everyone I have to get to work I have to start filming in like half an hour um, yeah I gotta make my hat what kind of hat will it be thank you everyone for coming bye